Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hi, and welcome back uh, to uh, Lecture 5 of Week 5, the last week of Dynamic Atomic Force Microscopy Methods. Um, we were talking in the last class about uh, the nature of interaction forces between the tip and the sample once the AFM is actually immersed in liquids. Um, and we did talk about the fact that uh, there are different kinds of forces uh, at play here that we have not considered in part one uh, of this Fundamentals of AFM class. In particular, some of the most important forces are electrostatic forces, Van der Waals forces, which together uh, are combined in this DLVO theory uh, that we talked about last time. Uh, and in addition to those, at very short range uh, of separations between the tip and the sample, one needs to consider hydration forces and possibly hydrophobic uh, interactions if the tip gets very close to the sample. And finally, if your tip and sample are not nice and smooth, but actually have long chain molecules sticking out of them, uh, you would need to go into understanding steric forces uh, whose origin is also uh, quite complicated. What we'll focus on today is uh, move to the cantilever. We've been focusing on tip sample interaction forces. And really the idea of uh, today's uh, lecture or this short lecture is to uh, provide an idea of what happens uh, when you put an oscillating cantilever in liquids. What happens to the oscillations of the cantilever itself? Because at the end of the day when we do a dynamic AFM, we're oscillating the probe and we're trying to understand the tip sample interaction forces through the changes that the forces cause in the oscillations uh, of the cantilever. So. Really, what we're going to do is just take certain snapshots of different effects um, of what happens to cantilevers and liquids. Uh, the first uh, concept I want to bring to your attention is the fact that um, uh, when you look at the resonance of a cantilever in air, uh, the thermal, thermally excited resonance in air versus in water, uh, they're different. So here I give you two examples. Um, uh, on the on the left is an example of a um, uh, short biolever, a small biolever. It's called. It's a really small cantilever, uh, and you can see uh, along the y-axis is basically the power spectral density uh, in um, uh, without units. On the right hand, on, on the y, on the x-axis, we've got the frequency content, and you can see that in air, uh, you know, there's a very nice sharp resonance peak with a Q factor of about 41, and the resonance peak in air uh, is about um, is about uh, between 40 and 50 kilohertz. And when you put the same cantilever in water, uh, the curve becomes the blue curve as shown in the power spectral density, where the resonance frequency drops from about 45 kilohertz to just below 10 kilohertz. Uh, moreover, the peak broadens. And if you try to find out what the Q factor is by fitting uh, the expression for the power spectral density due to thermal excitation that we covered uh, uh, in uh, week one of the class, uh, you'll actually find that the Q factor uh, is of the order of about uh, 1.8 uh, when you put it in water. So what, what we find is that the Q factor air uh, in water compared to air is about uh, 1 20th or 1 30th. Um, and the natural frequency in water compared to air is maybe one quarter or uh, maybe even lesser. The other effect that comes in is, you know, when the cantilever is in liquid, it's got a low Q factor and it's got a low resonance frequency. But another interesting thing that happens is when you bring the cantilever close to a flat sample, uh, that resonance frequency and a Q factor change a little more as well. So what you see, for example, in red is what happens to the Q factor and resonance frequency as you bring it close to the sample. What we find is the peak broadens even more and the Q becomes less. Not as much as the difference between air and water, but certainly there is a difference between water far from a surface and close to a surface. Why this matters is when you're imaging a sample, you're going to be tuning it far from a surface and then you bring it close to the sample to image the surface. So these little differences that happen in Q factors and resonance frequencies need to be uh, kept in mind, especially when one does uh, quantitative force reconstruction in liquids. Uh, now the question is, and on the right by the way, uh, I've shown similar results for a conventional long cantilever. 
where the Q in air is 53 uh, in liquid far from the sample is uh, 1.85, but in this case, as you bring it really close to the sample, uh, the Q factor, the resonance peak effectively vanishes, meaning that the Q factor has become less than, uh, less than one in this case. So the resonance frequency decreases in water by a factor of three to five compared to air, and the Q factor uh, can go down by a factor of uh, 10 to 30, depending on the cantilever uh, we're dealing with. Um, why this happens fundamentally has to do with, uh, not with the sample itself, but with the fact that the cantilever is now surrounded by water molecules, which is a dense, highly viscous fluid. Uh, and as the cantilever oscillates, it's actually moving along with it a large mass of water that has to move due to the cantilever oscillations. So this is called the added mass effect. And you can actually approximate uh, the added mass effect because of the resonance frequency in um, in water compared to air is about three to five, three to five times less, uh, you can actually calculate that the added mass of the surrounding water uh, is about 10 to 20 times that of the cantilever mass, suspended mass itself. So it's a very large uh, mass of water that's now forced to oscillate with the cantilever. Um, the difference in damping or Q factor has to do with the viscosity of the water. As the cantilever oscillates, uh, it sets up uh, shear in the fluid uh, near the edges of the cantilever. That shear causes a dissipation of energy, leading to uh, larger uh, losses, energy losses, and the oscillation energy of the cantilever is then lost into uh, viscous shear into the surrounding liquid. So this is a very important change that happens in uh, water compared to air. Um, but nonetheless, it's tempting to sit back and say that the entire theory that we discussed in uh, week one, two, three, in fact, all the way through the class of point mass models uh, for reconstructing interaction forces, for um, understanding uh, phase contrast and so on, is tempting to think that all the theory we developed can still be applied in liquids um, with a different resonance frequency of the cantilever and with a different Q factor. As long as you measure the Q factor, as long as you measure the um, resonance frequency using a thermal tune in liquids, um, perhaps we can use all the entire theory that we have talked about in the past. So in the rest of uh, this lecture, I'll point out complications to that hypothesis um, that one needs to be aware of. The first is uh, this concept of eigenmodes. Now, we had talked about early in this um, in this part two the fact that when you drive a uh, cantilever at resonance, it takes a certain shape and oscillates with a certain shape, and we take that shape of oscillation and replace it by a point mass model, which has the same potential energy uh, as that of the shape of uh, uh, as that of the vibrating beam as it resonates. So it's a very important question to ask um, if the shape of the cantilever in which it vibrates at a resonance, is it the same in air compared to liquids or not? And uh, why this is important is because you may want to do a uh, stiffness calibration of the cantilever in air, and if you put it into liquids and if the shape in which it oscillates changes, the, the entire equivalence between uh, the oscillating cantilever and the point mass model is not going to be exactly the same because the shape of vibration and the associated potential energies might get different. So uh, this question was investigated in this article that I mentioned below and uh, I just want to point out that um, if you put such a cantilever in liquids and make measurements of um, you know the shapes in which they vibrate uh, thermally, um, you can actually get that um, if you look on the um, on the top right, you have a certain cantilever where um, the uh, blue refers to um, the eigenmodes that have been measured uh, in in uh, in air, and the red refers to the eigenmodes that have been measured in water. And uh, what one notices interestingly is that if you deal with a cantilever without a tip, uh, you can actually find that uh, the first eigenmode, which is the lowest frequency of resonance, uh, the shape of it does not change when you're in air or water. And if you go to the next row below on the left, you also find that for a cantilever with a tip, uh, the first eigenmode in air versus water does not change, the shape of it does not change. Um, when you go from air to water. So this is really good news. It tells us that the point mass model 
would work for the first eigen mode of the cantilever uh, very well. You can possibly calibrate uh, the stiffness in air and assume that the same stiffness applies uh, in liquids. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the second eigen mode, which is again something, it's an advanced topic, we haven't talked about higher eigen modes, but I just want to mention it. When you deal with higher eigen modes, there is a difference. Um, if you look at the bottom right, you find that in cantilevers with tips, there is a significant difference between the shape in which it vibrates in the second eigen mode uh, in air compared to water. So the conclusion is basically that uh, when you deal with higher eigen modes, uh, it's much better to actually do your stiffness calibration using thermal methods in liquid in the medium in which you're going to be imaging as opposed to doing it in air and assuming that the same calibration constant applies uh, for liquid media. The reasons for this effect have been discussed uh, in this article below here. I just wanted to point out that, you know, when one tries to go to dynamic A from in liquids, every hypothesis needs to be questioned and uh, validated or verified. A second important uh, difference or second important um, complication that occurs in liquids is that there is a significant difference between acoustic and direct or magnetic excitation in liquids. Um, like I showed to you, the Q factor is extremely small in liquids. And if you recall from a result we derived some time ago, that Q factor roughly uh, gives you uh, the ratio between um, the, the tip amplitude and the base motion required to acoustically excite a cantilever. So you can imagine that if the Q factor is of the order of one, it means that the effective base motion and the tip motion are going to be of the same value when you're at resonance. So this creates a very different picture of what acoustic excitation is in liquids. In liquids, therefore, acoustic excitation is not the base moving really slightly and the cantilever resonating with a high Q, but rather the picture in liquids is that the base motion is comparable to tip motion, which means uh, the cantilever oscillates like this. The base motion is very large compared to tip motion. Uh, on the other hand, when you deal with directly excited cantilevers, which include magnetically excited, Lorentz force excited, photothermally excited cantilevers, the force is applied only to the cantilever, so it's only the cantilever that vibrates. Uh, this leads to a very subtle and important distinction, um, which is that when you deal with directly excited cantilevers, as shown in the bottom left, uh, what you measure is the bending deflection of the cantilever due to the, fo due to the photodiode. And uh, what you end up measuring is simply going to be the tip deflection, the absolute tip deflection, W. On the other hand, when you deal with um, acoustically excited cantilevers and liquids, uh, two problems arise. The first problem or first complication is that the base motion is actually a lot, but what we measure using the photodiode is actually the bending of the cantilever, the W. Uh, so the bending of the cantilever is basically the motion of the tip with respect to the base of the cantilever. As a result, what we observe in acoustic mode AFM in liquids is not the absolute motion of the tip in an absolute reference frame, rather it's the relative motion of the tip relative to the base motion. Uh, this has very important consequences when one is trying to do force reconstruction on samples in liquid environments using acoustic uh, AFM. The fact that the base is moving so much and what you observe is not the absolute motion of the tip. Uh, a second complication factor that occurs is the fact that in liquids, you implement acoustic excitation by having uh, high frequency dithering piezo vibrations that are transferred uh, from the dither piezo through the surrounding structure to the base of the cantilever. Uh, the surrounding structure and the holder uh, of the cantilever are all surrounded by liquids. So what happens is this vibration uh, of the structures supporting the cantilever transmit the vibration to the surrounding fluid and the surrounding fluid then is also oscillating and that also exerts a force on the cantilever. So that's a second complicating feature in liquids and this fluid-borne excitation force is actually quite significant in liquids. In fact, in liquid environments you can have a cantilever that's just positioned away from a surface and it can just excite the surface without the tip being in contact with the, with the surface and the cantilever will start vibrating because the motion of the surface generates uh, motion in the fluid which then shakes the cantilever. So you can get uh, non-contact interactions between vibrating surfaces and cantilevers in liquid environments.
So these are the two complicating features, the mechanisms of excitation and the observables, what we observe in the AFM, both are going to be different, whether we, depending on if we do direct excitation or acoustic uh, mode excitation. Um, so out here, I show some experimental results out of uh, the um, uh, article uh, that's shown uh, at the bottom here. And um, what you see on the bottom left is um, the magnetic, same cantilever excited magnetically. So you got the amplitude and phase uh, of excitation. This is the phase lead, not the phase lag, because as excitation frequency increases, it goes down. So this is actually going to be phase lead. That's been plotted in degrees. And uh, superposed on the magnetic response, which is green, experimentally green uh, response, is the thermal response, which is the fluctuating uh, curve sitting on top. Uh, and what's also been plotted is the uh, theoretical uh, magnetic exc excitation shown in dashed green. And what you find is that the solid green and dashed green, uh, the experimental uh, amplitude versus frequency versus the theoretical one based on the transfer function we derived uh, some time ago in this class lie right on top of each other, which means that uh, when, one uses, when one uses magnetic excitation for the first mode uh, in this frequency range, one gets a very faithful reproduction uh, compared to theory and uh, it's exactly as the transfer function is exactly as predicted by theory. On the right, the same cantilever is now excited using uh, dithopias of excitation uh, in liquids. And um, what I've plotted in the dashed red curve uh, here is the, um, uh, the theoretical acoustic or the base, base excited uh, cantilever response, which if you recall, uh, we studied some time ago with the point mass model, what happens to the amplitude as a function of frequency as you change the frequency of the base motion. And uh, the dashed red line tells us the theoretical response, uh, telling us that we have small observable, observed deflection at small frequencies and after resonance we get a good appreciable um, um, observed deflection. But the experimental curve is shown in solid red and shows a very interesting phenomenon which is very different from the theoretical uh, transfer function of the base excited cantilever. It shows a number of peaks and uh, the phase response is also very far from the phase response of the theoretical uh, phase response of um, an acoustic, a base excited cantilever. Uh, the reason for this has been um, understood from a while, quite a time ago, going back to these early papers shown below, which were some of the first papers that talked about this concept of forest of peaks. So let me go a little into detail about what we mean by forest of peaks. Why is it that the response in acoustic excitation is so different uh, from the ideal theoretical response? The fundamental reason for it is that really if you think about it, uh, the dithopias is embedded inside a structure and there are multiple uh, pieces and clamps that kind of go together all the way to uh, the cantilever holder or the chip holder and the chip itself uh, before you reach the cantilever. So if you think about it, uh, there are a lot of substructures. Uh, there is the piezo, dithopiezo itself, that's the, the, the communicating uh, uh, structural pieces that get you to the clip that holds the chip, each one has its own resonance frequency. As a result, what ends up happening is that as you sweep the excitation frequency, um, you end up hitting certain frequencies at which these substructures might resonate. So you might get, for example, uh, the chip holder uh, starts resonating. So uh, the base motion of the cantilever as you sweep the drive frequency, uh, you know, you can hit one of those substructure resonances and the base motion suddenly starts increasing because you've hit a resonance, not of the cantilever, but of something else that lies between the dithopiezo and the base of the cantilever. And then as you increase the frequency, you go past that resonance and again, you're not vibrating much. You might go to another frequency where suddenly you hit another resonance of a substructure and it starts vibrating. And then again, you go past it and it, and it doesn't vibrate anymore. Um, so what this basically means is that all these substructure resonances, what they end up doing is to change uh, the base motion of the cantilever as a function of frequency. And that's what I've sketched on the right is that if you were to observe with a laser Doppler vibrometer on some direct measurement technique, what happens to the base of the cantilever as you sweep um, the excitation frequency applied to the dithopiezo, you'll find that the base excitation is actually not constant, but that you have these resonances corresponding to a resonance of each of these substructures. Now, 
A good question is how come we didn't think about this issue when we were studying tuning curves in air? And the reason is that all these substructure resonances <coughs> have low Q factors, typically in the range of 5 to 10. Uh, and uh, in air, the cantilever cues are much higher, of the order of 100 or 200 or 300. As a result, when you're working this out in air, uh, the motion of the dithopiezer is much smaller compared to the cantilever oscillation amplitude, uh, but also its Q factors, the Q factors of all these substructural resonances are much smaller. As a result, the, the sharpest peak you get is due to the cantilever, and all these other um, uh, uh, perturbations are somehow seen very little compared to the main dominant peak of the cantilever mechanical resonance. However, in liquids, as we have just learned, the Q factor of the cantilever is typically of the order of one or two, which means the Q factor of the cantilever itself is lower than the Q factors of these substructure resonances. So, in fact, when you put the thing into liquids, the cantilever into liquids, the peaks you observe, the sharp peaks we observe in the response are actually due to substructure resonances. They're in fact not due to the cantilever resonance, which is a much broader uh, low Q resonance peak. So this is a very important uh, effect uh, that we need to keep in mind when we deal with uh, uh, tapping mode or dynamic A from in liquids. Um, you can obviously choose any peak, you can choose one, one peak in a forest of peaks to do imaging, and you can always get an image. But it's very important to realize that it may not be the resonance frequency of the cantilever. And whenever one tries to do uh, quantitative AFM, it's very important to understand uh, what is the amount of base motion so you can convert all the formulas we've been talking about in the past uh, to uh, interaction forces, quantitative interaction forces between the tip and the sample. Uh, which is why from the early days it was understood that uh, acoustic excitation in liquids is not the best way to do uh, quantitative force reconstruction on surfaces, which is why there have been a lot of efforts at trying to resolve this forest of peaks problem uh, in acoustically excited cantilevers and liquids. Uh, I show here three different uh, groups that have attempted different techniques to do so. Uh, the first technique uh, recognizes the fact that you have many substructure resonances, so it proposes a solution uh, that the uh, excited dithopias will be located as close to the cantilever base as possible, eliminating effectively all the middlemen in between. And this was proposed uh, by Sophie Marcedo and Jean-Pierre Amé's group in Bordeaux. And uh, what you see with this solution is the tuning curve before, uh, in liquids, before the change is made, shows a forest of peaks. Um, and um, when you go ahead and make this change, in, 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 in the dash, the blue curve, actually tells you the new response, which shows very clear resonance peaks corresponding to the first and second modes of the cantilever showing up. Even more importantly than the amplitude response, the phase response becomes much cleaner, showing the standard um, uh, phase lag response as expected. There are still some distortions to the phase, suggesting that this technique also doesn't completely eliminate uh, the effect of substructure resonances, but uh, it does do so to a large degree. A second effort is, uh, well, if the Q factors of the substructure resonance are about five or 10, why don't we reduce the Q factors of these substructure resonances by applying a damping material to all the substructures that uh, are important? And so this approach was taken uh, out of uh, the, 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 the group of um, uh, uh, Julio Herrero, Julio Gomez Herrero in Madrid. And um, what you see out here is a before and after image of uh, tuning curve. And you certainly see that to some extent, uh, the forest of peaks has been reduced and you more or less have a dominant resonance peak. But even so, you can see distortions that are going to be most likely due to uh, substructure resonances that are still active. A third approach is to try and do an impedance matching between the uh, all the materials that make up the vibration transmission path from the piezo all the way to the base uh, of the cantilever. And this was the approach uh, that was uh, taken in Japan by Fukuma. And um, based on that, you can see the before and after results that show an appreciable improvement in the frequency response of cantilevers, basic sided cantilevers. Um, in addition uh, to this, I would like to quick bring to your attention um, what happens to these resonant cantilevers and liquids as you bring them close to the sample? Uh, remember, everything that we studied uh, in um, 
uh, early part of this class suggested you could still assume that the motion was sinusoidal albeit with a reduced amplitude and phase and a, and a changed phase when an oscillating cantilever is brought close to the sample. The question is, is that still valid when you uh, work this out in liquids? And so here's an example uh, that shows um, uh, oscillating approach curves in liquids and in air. Um, and uh, this is taken from an early work uh, out of Putman's group. And what you see out here very interestingly is the fact that uh, when one is dealing with oscillations in liquids, uh, when we start interacting with the sample, those nice sinusoidal waveforms are perturbed very locally, and you can actually look at the waveform of oscillation and figure out where the tip sample contact is actually happening because there is a high frequency jitter that tends to accompany these contact events. So this again suggests to us that, uh, you know, the whole, all the assumptions that we've been making in the earlier part of the class uh, need to be carefully taken into account when uh, dealing with operation in liquids. Uh, for, here I show to you another uh, experimental effort that experimentally looks at the waveforms of oscillation of the cantilevers as it interacts with uh, substrates. And here also you find, this is magnetically excited cantilevers. What you find is you get this nice sinusoidal waveform, but as you approach the sample, uh, as you come closer to the sample, these waveforms get perturbed and there are high frequency jitters that occur near the contact events, which were eventually shown to be due to the fact that uh, when you deal with these kind of oscillations, you can actually end up exciting some higher harmonics and higher frequencies of the cantilever uh, locally where you're tapping on the sample. So uh, one needs to be careful in taking a lot of the mathematical theory that we've been developing the early part of the class to try and, uh, you know, to if one wants to apply that theory to liquid uh, AFM situations, uh, there are some caveats that need to be studied very carefully. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll uh, continue in the next lecture uh, on a review of the entire course.